We have questions of God, just like him. You know, why did my grandma go to the hospital? What is your purpose for my life? Where do you want me to serve? What do you want me to be? What do you want me to do? Uh, and we ask those questions, and we, we want to hear from God. We want to hear about others hearing from God. Um, it always encourages me to hear people say, you know, oh, well, God, God spoke to me. God told me this. Uh, even though, honestly, sometimes I am a slight skeptic, you know, it's like, really? Um, but, you know, when those things are confirming, when they're within the will of God and, and, you know, they hear that, and it's probably just my sinful nature of saying, gosh, I wish God spoke to me like he's speaking to you. Um, the truth is, is that, you know, God is there. And we may question and say, you know, are you, are you there, God? What's up, God? Where are you? Hello, why won't you talk to me like you talked to Moses, like you talked to King David? Why don't you do these things, God? But what I would tell that young man, just like I would tell anybody that's asking that question, um, if there's an issue in hearing from God or communicating with God, he is always there. He is everywhere. He is always broadcasting. If there's trouble hearing it, the problem is on our end, the connection on our end. And, and there's ways to improve that, um, but that's what I'm going to talk about next week. I'm going to say, how do I get to hear God better? How can I hear him better? Um, so that's just a teaser for next week. This week, though, we're going to talk in broader terms about hearing God's voice. And let's start by answering the question that's on your bulletin there. How do we know God's voice? How do we know God's voice? That's the fill in the blank on your bulletin there. And the answer is... By knowing God. Okay. Um, I want to share a couple of ways that I've heard God's voice this year. First, a um, little while ago, I had a dream, and, and that's biblical. God speaks to people in dreams. Uh, God also speaks to people in showers. So I had this dream, a uh, pretty vivid dream, that we had a Celebrate Recovery program here at Annalise Springs Church. And I know we've had it in, in the past and years ago, but this dream was like, hey, this is going on right now. This is happening. And so I got up and I got in the shower and started talking to God. And, and you can ask any of the pastors here, Isaac or Frank or I, um, that's where God speaks to us quite a bit. I think that is a biblical thing um, because, you know, you, you're naked and unashamed in front of God. And, uh, you know, nothing between you and him, just sitting there talking to him. And so we, we hear him in the shower. So I'm, I'm talking and I'm like, okay, so if we do this, how do we do it? What does it look like? Who's involved? Where do we go? How, you know, how? I need some, some guidance. I need some direction, God. You know, you've given me this, this vision, this dream that we have this thing going on, and I know there's a need here, so let's, how do we do it? Show me. So um, he actually didn't answer me in the shower, I, and, but uh, came here to work and opened my email, started checking email, and there's an email from uh, Saddleback Church and the Celebrate Recovery West Coast Summit that's happening this month. And I'm like, well, that's not in the budget. We're not going to go to that, but, you know, hey, that's, Okay, so now I've had a dream, now I've talked to God about it, now I see this email here about that, and I think they had some deal on, you know, buy the church package and get the materials and stuff. So then I start flipping through the communication cards, which are at the bottom of your bulletin, by the way, and as I'm flipping through, I get to one that I've seen for several weeks in a row now, uh, where the person wrote under special interest, chemical dependency. N not as in having it, uh, getting that going sometime probably after summer. And uh, so that was one way that I heard from God. Now, you know, in reality, all of us struggle with things like that, our sinful nature. We're human beings, and sometimes that takes the form of chemical dependency. Sometimes it's other things, uh, bad language, uh, listening to rock music. I'm just kidding, that's not really. Well, it depends on what the music is, but... Um, and sometimes it's just not acknowledging God for, for who He is. So we're, we're living apart from God, and we're struggling with our, with our sin nature. Uh, we all have issues, which is why Jesus told us to share the gospel with all creation. And which brings me to the second point that of hearing God's voice. There's a certain demographic for whom uh, God has placed a burden on my heart. And what that means is that I care about uh, this, this people group. And I have since BC, uh, before conversion, before Christianity, I've, I've loved this people group. And, and, you know, so once I accepted Jesus as my Savior, once I became a Christian and realized that, then what do I want to do right away is share the good news with these people, right? So over the past several months, God has brought people into my life who, who share that burden, 
um, and we've talked about this, and so now there's a sufficient number of people to form a core group to uh, plan and pray and prepare to reach out to that people group. So I'm not, I'm not going to move again the rest of the time, but I'm not any. <laughs> I can't really reveal anything more specific now than just this kind of vague example that God loves all people. Yeah, God loves all people. Um, hold on. Okay. God loves all people, and when we begin loving people in his name and for his kingdom and lifting them up in prayer to him, he will hear and he will answer and respond to us. So uh, one last way, uh, you may have noticed there's grocery bags under the chairs. Now, what that is for is in those bags, there's a shopping list. On one side, it is a shopping list for the food closet. On the other side, it's a back to school shopping list. When I was meeting with the uh, missions committee a few weeks ago, we were talking about things that we don't do anymore, things that we want to do, things that we still do do. Oops, I said do do. Um, <laughs> things that we still do, and uh, one of them brought up, hey, there's their sales right now, because we're talking about Operation Christmas Child, and they're like, school supplies are on sale now, you can get really good deals, you start shopping now so that in November when we put those boxes together, you don't have to. But it's also back to school time, and we have several teachers in this congregation, some of them teach in this area, in this district, like the school right over there, uh, I don't know if any of them teach right here, I know someone works there, but um, so there's, there's teachers in this congregation that could be blessed with school supplies for those kids in their classes that they know are low income. Uh, we would have done this a little bit sooner, but we didn't want to think people were, we were copying uh, Operation Backpack, so we're doing our own thing. But so there's school supply shopping list. And if we can't help those teachers in this area, then there's a teacher that teaches in a very low income place that can always use uh, school supplies. And what, what happens is these teachers end up buying these things with their own money and giving them to the kids. So we want to help them out. So in the bags are these shopping lists. And so what this does is create a triple win in, in that first off, we're blessing people either with the food closet or with the shopping list. Uh, second off, you know, we're, we're honoring God by helping out um, those, those that need help showing compassion to those in need. Uh, and the third thing is, you get a shopping bag courtesy of Bel Air. Yes, this message this morning is brought to you by Bel Air. Um, <laughs> they gave us the shopping bags. So if nothing else, you get a bag that you can take home, make a book cover, um, put something in. But so there's the triple win. You get blessed, other people get blessed, God gets honored by all of this. So that was uh, God speaking to us. We kind of were like, hey, how can we do this? We put it together, and here we are. So there you go, hearing God's voice. Any questions? All right, have a good day. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, when we, we, just like that boy Michael, we want questions answered by God. We want to hear his voice. And so this week's biblical example of someone hearing uh, God's voice is Samuel, the, in the first book by his name, First Samuel. So Samuel is a guy that we can all relate to. And that's the picture of, of Samuel's mom, Hannah, giving him to the high priest. Um, Unlike King David, you know, King David was a man after God's own heart. Not many of us can confidently say that we are people after God's own heart. If we did, that would probably be a pride issue. But um, the other thing is not many of us can say that, you know, we are the anointed king of God's people chosen to lead in, in his stead, you know, to represent him in front of those people. Uh, that's King David. We can say, though, like Samuel, that we've been in places we did not expect to be, that we were doing things we didn't necessarily plan on doing. How many of you have ever worked for a boss that you didn't really care for? Yeah, when I was self-employed, that was... <laughs> How many of you did something because your mother wanted you to do it? How many of your mothers, how many of you mothers wanted your kids to do things, right? Okay. Um, how many of you heard things that you didn't want to hear or had to deliver news or message that you didn't really want to deliver? Okay. Um, how many of you have found yourself in a place where you never thought you'd be doing something you never thought that you'd be doing and being treated probably differently by people? Okay. This is Samuel's story. We're going to look at a chapter of his life today in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and see how this prophet of God first heard God's voice and how we can hear God's voice in our own lives today. But first, stand with me for the reading of the word. 
It is. First Samuel chapter 3, verse 10. It's on the screen behind me. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. You may be seated. So to give you the backstory, uh, the picture of that slide, Hannah um, is Samuel's mother. And she, uh, like many important women in the Bible, is barren, meaning she is childless. Which, you know, in a society whose economy relies upon bearing children to do work for you, to care for you in your old age, this poses a bit of a problem for her not having a child. So she lives, plus she, you know, this is the time of the judges, which I'll talk about in a second, but his, her husband has another wife who actually has children. So how, how much more difficult is that? You know, because she gets picked on by this other wife. So she goes uh, up to the, to the tent of meeting. They are still, uh, hadn't built the temple yet. They're in the tabernacle. And she prays to God that her affliction would be relieved. You know, please God, give me a child uh, so that I can say I've had a child and I will dedicate him to you if you give me this child. And as she's praying, Eli, the high priest, is sitting there, and he sees her lips moving, but hears nothing coming out, and thinks that she's drunk, you know, because it's 10 o'clock in the morning, and what else are you going to do at 10 o'clock in the morning? Um, she isn't, of course, and, and she says, no, sir, look, it is only 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm a good woman. I don't do that. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just praying to God, lifting up my concerns to him. And so Eli says, go, um, just go, and uh, may God answer your prayers. Okay. He's the high priest. He should be like pouring out blessings, but it's more kind of a dismissal. Just go and, and may God answer your prayers because I don't want you around here anymore. So uh, that's how Samuel came about. The God, God blessed Hannah, gave her this child when he was weaned. So when he was no longer nursing, which, you know, at that time, three, four years old, um, she dedicates him to the Lord, gives him to uh, Eli, the high priest, to, to use as a servant there. So... Eli the high priest, let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, he is the high priest, so he's God's chosen mediary between man and God. He goes and intercedes on behalf of the people. He offers the sacrifices, he you know, prays to God, he makes atonement on the day of atonement. Uh, he has two wicked sons that extort people, and they have a promiscuous lifestyle. You can read about that in the first couple of chapters of 1 Samuel. There's all kinds of wickedness going on in the world at this time, uh, which is the time of Judges. And in Judges 21-25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Does that sound familiar? So Eli's got these two sons. They're running amok. They're doing all kinds of evil on the side of the Lord. And then along comes Samuel, uh, a child who is God's fulfillment of the request of a woman who sought God and his kingdom in her affliction. And so he rewarded her with his child. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to 1 Samuel chapter 3. Uh, that's in the Old Testament. And uh, if you need a Bible, you can raise your hand. We'll have the Bible cart come around. We'll pass one out to you. If you don't have a Bible of your very own, you can keep that. Or uh, you can go to the information kiosk and we'll get you one afterwards if you just want to borrow this one. But 1 Samuel chapter 3. Here we go. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. Basically the people had turned away from God and were doing all kinds of things, running amok, doing whatever they wanted to do. And so God had you know, hey, you're going to be that way. Uh, I'm still here, but you're turning away from me, so I'm not going to reveal myself too much. In fact, in this whole time of Judges and Samuel, no, there's only oh, half a dozen or so times where God specifically has you know, a man of God that is saying the word of God and sharing it with people. Uh, a lot of the rest of the time is just the stories of people doing foolish things. So people didn't expect to hear from God. At that time, Eli, this is verse 2, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his, old, in his own place. So he is old. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. 
the, the lamp, that's the menorah with all the candle things sticking up. And that would be lit at sundown and was supposed to stay lit until sunrise. So it's, you know, early in the morning after dark. Uh, here it is. The lamp is not burned out. Samuel is uh, physically closer to God than, than anyone else can really be at that time. He's laying down next to the Ark of the Covenant. This is where the tablets of the Ten Commandments was placed. This represented the seat of God when God would descend from heaven in a, in a cloud of smoke or fire and be there. He was supposed to sit on this Ark. You know, obviously God is spirit and he wouldn't physically sit, but that was represented his presence. So here's Samuel lying down right there. Uh, verse 4, Then the Lord called Samuel and, and he said, Here I am. And ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. Samuel, you now for several years, has been the servant of Eli. And here it is, you know, zero dark 30. He hears this voice, Samuel. He's like, oh, it's Eli. What's he want? Water? Does he need the chamber pot? I he can't see. Oh, I was having such a good dream right then, too. So he's got to get up, and he goes, here I am. And Eli's like, no, I didn't, I didn't call you. I did not call my son. Uh lie down. And so he went and lay down. And the Lord called again in verse 6, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. So he's like, the old guy's playing jokes on me. This is not funny. You know, tomorrow's the day I got to sweep out the sanctuary and I need my rest. And <sighs> Verse 7, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So Samuel is like a lot of people today uh, in America who would say, if they asked, you know, religious preference, well, first off, a lot of people would say no religious preference. Uh, many others would say a Christian. And these people that would say Christian have not set foot in a church in years, if ever, uh, have not crocked a Bible in years, if ever. But by default, they know that there is God, and you know there's a majority of Christian churches in America, so they would say, yeah, I, I know God. I know there is a God, but I don't actually know him. And so Samuel's kind of in this situation, because again, the word of the Lord is infrequent. You know, He's not talking a lot. God has not manifested himself in a long time. Um, he's probably questioning, like many people are, is there really a God? Why would God let all these things happen? So he doesn't know the Lord personally, but obviously being a Hebrew, he knows that there is God and that he's serving in his tent. And the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him uh, means that God has not spoken to him yet. Verse 8, And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. I know he's old and blind, but he's the high priest. He, at least once a year, should be talking to God. Um, a lot more frequently, you would hope, uh, being that guy who, you know, intercedes on behalf of the people. And yet, third time's a charm. It takes him three times to perceive that, oh, wait a minute, Samuel's not playing me and I'm not playing him. It must be the Lord talking. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And then verse 10, like we read, and the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant hears. So this is the call of Eli, or excuse me, Samuel, uh, into becoming a prophet of the Lord. And now, verses 11 through 14, uh, the Lord tells Samuel his wonderful plan for Eli's life. The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. That means it's bad news. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Now earlier in, in this book, I think like chapter 2, God had sent another prophet to Eli and said, Hey, you, your sons are going crazy and you're not doing anything. You need to fix things or else. And so now he comes to Samuel and said, It's or else time. And 
he says, there's no way that you can pay for these sins anymore. Okay? They used to uh, offer animal sacrifices that would atone for or pay for the sin. And now God says, no matter what you offer me, I'm not accepting it. You're done. Time's up. And we look at that and go, but isn't God a loving God? Doesn't God forgive? Yeah, he does. Um, but just like, you know, in the beginning, the, the word of the Lord was infrequent because the people had turned away from him. And so when God allows things like that to happen, I, I mean, read it for yourself to see what the sons were doing. But it was not good. They were, you know, like I said, extorting um, and other things. And yet God didn't strike them dead. In Leviticus chapter 10, when Aaron's sons brought unauthorized fire, they brought an unauthorized incense offering to the Lord, he struck them dead like that, fried them, boom. Chapter 10, read it, just fried them right there, killed them. Which, you know, when you read this and you look at the world around us and you understand that, uh, yes, men and women can do good things, but in reality, the nature of man is not good. Okay, it is a sinful nature. And so what we really deserve, uh, as the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. God should strike each of us dead, but he does not. And that is his mercy, that he doesn't give us what we deserve. What he offers through his son Jesus is grace, uh, eternal life, relationship with God. That which we do not deserve, God offers. So God allowed this stuff to happen, and the reason he did that is because he's a patient God. And his patience is for your repentance. He gives you time to realize what you're doing is wrong. And he gives you time to turn away from that and turn towards him. But God is also just. Okay? And so in his perfect justness, in his perfect judgment, he can say enough is enough and I'm done with you, Eli. And that's what he does here. Verse 15, Samuel lay until morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. Hey, uh, boss, I got some bad news. Um, and I told someone yesterday, bad news does not get better with age. Okay? It does not get better with age. If you have to deliver a message, do it as gracefully and as mercifully and as swiftly as possible. Because what happens is you have that bad news that you still have to deliver, and if you wait a week to deliver it, now it's the bad news and the week, and why did you wait so long to tell me, and it just compounds. Bad news does not get better with age. But of course, he's afraid to tell his boss what he has to tell him. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, and he said, here I am. And Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. The word of the Lord was rare. And it took this guy, Eli, the high priest, three times to recognize, oh, here comes the word of the Lord. So now what's he want? He wants to hear it. You know, this is a great thing. God has spoken uh, to Samuel, sure, not, you know, to Eli, but God has spoken, and Eli hungers for it. He wants to hear it. Um, a hunger for the word of the Lord, which, you know, the Bible we call God's word, is rare. Uh, not just in society in America, but I think in American churches as well. Um, a hunger for the Lord. And yet here, Sam or Eli is, and he hungers for it. And, and to answer the question, how do we hear God's voice by knowing him? How do we get to know him by reading his word? So Eli hungers for the word of God. And then he invokes this uh, potential curse on Samuel. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. Um, this is kind of a reverse thing. Usually, like, if you're making an agreement with someone, you know, hey, I agree to do this with you, and if I fail on my end, may this happen to me. So it's kind of like, you know, a promise, a pledge that I'll hold up my end of the bargain, and if I don't, may I be cursed. But instead, Eli turns it and says, if you don't tell me what God told you, all the bad stuff that he told you, may God do that to you as well. So, in verse 18, Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he, that's Eli, said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. So he had been warned, and he knew it, and God has now spoken, and Eli accepts the sovereignty of God. God is just. Uh, he is holy. He is perfect. Let him do what seems good to him, because, I mean, you know, who are we to question God's judgment? 
In verse 19 then, Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So we see there that uh, Samuel's words that God gave him were spoken, that those things came true. And by that, all people from Dan in the north of Israel to Beersheba in the south, that means the whole land, everybody knew that Samuel was a prophet. And as that happened, as Samuel was faithful to God, he was then faithful to him to continue to use him as a prophet, to show people that he was a prophet. And uh, everyone knew that. And the Lord continued to appear to Samuel. So here we are uh, now. Let me ask you a, a few questions here. First off, is God calling to you? Is God calling to you? But you're like Samuel, and you don't recognize his voice. Maybe that's because you've never entered that relationship with him uh, through Jesus. Maybe you have said, um, yeah, there's a God, and I'm going to go check it out. I'm going to go to church, and I want to hear God's voice. Maybe, you know, you've been doing things that you ought not to be doing and you've had this funny feeling you know like someone's watching you and like oh i probably shouldn't be doing this i might get caught well that funny feeling that someone's watching you is god watching you he's there okay and the funny feeling that you're getting is him telling you you need to stop this you need to turn away from this and turn towards me and it's not you know an oppressive uh you know ha caught you type of god it's I love you, and what you're doing is displeasing, and I would rather you turn towards me and away from that stuff. And maybe that's the voice that, that you hear from God right now. Or maybe you're like Eli, okay, and, and you know God, and, and you've talked to him, but right now you're not hearing from him. Uh, you're busy, you're tired, the things of this world can do that to us, can it not um, it's been so long that you heard from him that you're just not feeling it anymore. You don't remember the last time you heard from him. Um, but now you're, you're getting the feeling right now that, gosh, I, I feel that God wants to speak to me somehow. So think about that and, and answer this or think about this. How do we know God's voice? Well, we already said that, you know, by knowing God. In the beginning of this chapter, no one expected to hear God because they hadn't heard from him in a while. So the first step to, to hearing God's voice, knowing God's voice, is have that expectation. Okay, Expect to hear from God. Expect to hear from God. Know God and know his word so that when he does speak, you can recognize it as his voice. That it's him and not someone else. And then the last thing is draw closer to God. Okay. The Apostle John was one of the 12 original apostles. In fact, he was one of the first ones that Jesus said, follow me, uh, and John did. And he was there for all the big events, the raising of the, the dead girl, uh, the transfiguration of Jesus, you know, where he shone in heavenly glory and Moses and Elijah were there. Uh, John was there for all that stuff. At the Last Supper, uh, which we commemorated with communion today, the way they would eat then was at low tables and they would recline on their left elbow and they would eat with their right hand because that's the clean hand. And so Jesus is there and the guy in front of him with his back to him was the apostle John, which is why, uh, you know, Peter told him, hey, ask him who's going to betray him because it was easy for John to lean back on Jesus's chest and go, who is it, Lord? That's uh, the Apostle John. He, when Jesus called, answered and followed him and stayed close to him his whole life. He was rewarded. <laughs> kind of a tough reward. He was uh, rewarded by seeing all the other 11 apostles martyred, killed, and he was the last one. But uh, God used him to write the Gospel of John. God used him to write three letters to the churches, um, conveniently titled 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. <laughs> so so they're easy to remember. And in his long life, by the way, John had the nickname Old Camel Knees 
because uh, he spent so much time on his knees in prayer. He was rewarded with uh, the revelation of the second coming of Christ. So, as we uh, want to hear God's voice, we want to be like the Apostle John and, and be that close to Jesus and just pursue that relationship with him. So when he speaks, we'll be like, oh yeah, I hear you, I hear you. So here's your thought for the week. Where are you on your journey from here to him? Are you Samuel? You don't really know God, but you feel he might be calling to you. Or are you Eli, um, that you've known God, but you know you, he haven't really sat down and talked for a while? Or are you the disciple whom Jesus loved? That's the Apostle John. You're just in this wonderful, blessed relationship with him. And I know that some of you here this morning are in that type of relationship. <laughs> and I don't want to... Uh, you know, be like Eli, but you should share that with others. You should share that with others so they see it. It's, it's not just for you. It is a gift from God that should be shared. So the next step uh, is to commit to take the next step on this journey to get to know God's voice. And so as the band comes up, I'm going to pray for that. Uh, each person here is on their own journey. You know what the next step is. The next step may be answering that call that is a vague feeling uh, that someone's calling you, you know, like Samuel, uh, God calling you into a relationship. Or it may be, uh, hey, let's rekindle this relationship that we've had. Will and Kitty Harless were here first hour. They're celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary today. Um, you, you don't make it 50 years in a relationship by not talking to each other, okay? Enough said there. And if you are in that relationship like the Apostle John, then I'm going to praise that too. So.